invite you to open your Bible with me today to the book of Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. And we've been going through the book of Revelation, taking it a chapter at a time, and today we're really going to unpack, unfold chapter 8 and chapter 9, speaking of the trumpets or the trumpet of doom here that it describes them as, as we're entering now the great tribulation. As we're studying this, it's, there's, it's very important that we realize that we are studying now New Testament prophecy of last day events. New Testament prophecy of last day events. What do we call this now in the Bible? The study of what? It's called eschatology. Would you write that down? Eschatology. It means the study of end times. The study of end times. But how can we as believers today, knowing the things that are taking place in our world, seeing the darkness that is around us, how can we, as we study eschatology and prophecy now, have peace, trust God, seeing it is well with our soul? Because we know how the story ends. <laughs> We're raptured up to be with the Lord in heaven forever, and he comes to finally, once and for all, destroy Satan and cast into the lake of fire, and he is forever victorious. How many of us can praise God for that, that we know the end of how the story ends? He is forever victorious. We have peace in that. We can say it is well with our soul. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 says this, heaven and earth will pass away. Yes, all of this will pass away. Everything that you see will pass away, but my words, trust my words, my words will by no means pass away. So we are to pay attention to what God has to say in his word about the last day events. Now, chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, if you are with us last week, was a foreword of what is to come later on in the book. It serves to us as an intermission. And we see there that at the last days, many will come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. There's going to be a great revival that's going to take place during that time, during the tribulation period. And that even in the darkest times, even throughout the first half of the tribulation period, and then the last half called the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of this period, God's grace is still there. He's faithful to show his mercy even in the darkest hour. But what happens after the church is raptured now? The world is completely ruled by Satan now. And earth, now the world, the systems of this world have completely corrupted themselves now after the rapture, and they're giving over to sin without the Holy Spirit. This is here in chapter 8, as the seventh seal is loosed or broken now, all hell breaks loose. You talk about a state of emergency, oftentimes we become scared when we hear those words. We are in a state of emergency. Well, these trumpets that we're going to talk about in the next two chapters are the greatest state of emergency ever known to mankind. Why? Because there's going to be a doom, there's going to be a destruction, there's going to be a, a, a desperation as never seen before when God now pours his wrath upon this sinful world. Now, let's, let's look at this because we're going to see three major things as we study these two chapters. Number one, the preparation of the trumpets. The preparation. Number two, the desolation that takes place in the chapter. But also the liberation. What, what is liberated? What is set free here now in chapter 9 that we see? The preparation, the desolation, and then also the liberation. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 says this, and when he opened the seventh seal, we left off having only the sixth seal open, then an intermission. There was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. 
Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquakes. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Can we pray today? Lord, we thank you for your word. And we ask, Lord, that as we read your word today, as we open it up, Lord, that you would show us these truths that are here, that we would prepare our hearts to be raptured by you, Lord. Lord, that we would be moved, Lord, to repentance. They would be moved to evangelism, to share our faith. So we thank you because you have revealed this to us, Lord, so that we would know. You have, ma- you have made this known to us, Lord. So show us today, open up our eyes and our understanding. In Jesus' name, together the church would say, Amen. Now notice what happens here. That it says that when he, the Lamb of God, Christ, who is sitting on the throne, open or broke the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. We see here in the previous chapters that there was worship taking place in heaven. They were worshiping the lamb that was sitting on the throne, holy, 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 who, was the, who is the Lord, who was and is to come. But here we have a silence in heaven for half an hour. This is the calm before the storm. And it's not just any kind of silence. Now, I want you to know this. It's an eerie silence. Because the seventh seal of the scroll that only the Lamb can open has now been broken. All seven seals have been broken. There is a silence of anticipation at the reality of the judgment that is about to be unleashed. So just imagine this. The seventh seal is broken and it's open and all of heaven, all the angels The 24 elders and the four living creatures stand back in silence now in anticipation as to what God is about to do. Why? Because judgment is about to come to those in this world that live according to the flesh. The entire scroll has been opened to be read by everyone in heaven. This is, these are things that have never been seen from eternity's past. And judgment now, as the seventh seal is open, is intensifying and it's increasing. But notice what happens here. God waits for those 30 minutes. God waits for that half an hour before the judgment comes. Isn't it amazing to study God's grace and God's mercy that God always waits before the judgment comes? Why God is never in a hurry to judge anyone. God is never in a hurry to judge anyone. He is long-suffering. He is patient in his nature. That's exactly from all eternity. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you see how patient and long-suffering God is to us. Write this down, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. God is going to come. As some count slackness, he th- they, we think that he's slack and that he's not truly going to come, that he's taking a long time. But he is long-suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is the nature of the Lord. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice what happens here. After these seals are broken, God has been long-suffering, but the time of judgment has arrived. The time of judgment has arrived. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says this, Be silent in the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. This is the day of the Lord. The day of judgment, the day where God is pouring out his wrath upon the earth. The seventh seal has been broken. It leads now to seven trumpet judgments. So if you're a student of God's word and you like taking notes, write this down. We have the seven seals. Then we have the seven trumpets. Those are judgments that are intensifying within the last half of the tribulation period called the Great Tribulation. And then we have, finally, the seven bull judgments. And these take place in rapid succession now, just before the second coming of Christ. Just before the second coming of Christ, the judgment takes place. Now, trumpets here had important uses in the Bible. 
If you study the Old Testament and you go to the book of Numbers, you know that trumpets were very useful. It was an instrument to announce very important things. For example, when the trumpet sounded, they called God's people, the nation of Israel, together so the law could be read to them. So you would hear the trumpet sound. That means everyone gather together. We're going to hear now the reading of God's law. Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10 also tells us that when it was time to announce war, a trumpet blast would be now heard. So when there was also a time to announce to come and hear God's word, you would hear the trumpet. You would also hear the trumpet when they announced war, but also you would hear a trumpet to announce special times. What kind of special times where maybe a king was anointed and a king was enthroned? They would sound the trumpet, gather together, because the king is being anointed over now the kingdom. He is being enthroned now. This is so incredible because the sound of these seven trumpets that we're about to read about remind us and announce one thing, a declaration of war. God is judging this world. There's a war that's going to be taking place like never been sinned before. The trumpets announce the war, but the trumpets also announce another thing. And I want you to know this as we read these seven trumpets. What they're also announcing is that the fact that God is anointed king, that God is enthroned in his glory, and he's ready to judge his enemies. They're announcing that God is ready, sitting on the throne, anointed king, ready to judge. And we must remember that as we see this. So what happens here is they prepare, ready to sound, verse 2, and I saw seven angels who would stand before God in his presence. And to them were given seven trumpets. He saw seven angels standing with those seven trumpets. Now he's going to describe heaven. And as he describes heaven here, we see that the tabernacle was a model of heaven. So as we describe the the brazen altar and the altar of sacrifice, these are things that we read about in the Old Testament. And they are only a type or a model, the tabernacle, of what is there in the presence of God. That's why when we read the Old Testament, notice this, you're getting a picture of what you're truly going to see in the presence of God, the altar, the incense. You're going to see that right before the throne of God, before the most holy place where he's there enthroned. We have to do our homework. That way when we get there, we're not so astonished. We know, wow, I know what this is now. I did my homework. I've read the Old Testament. I see what's taking place here. I know the setup. I see the layout now that God has described in his word. But notice in verse 2, as it describes it, these seven trumpets, verse 3, now then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. We know of two altars in the tabernacle, right? Well, here speaks of another angel, a fifth angel. And he came with a censer or a burner, a golden pan now, that was used, this censer, this golden pan, in verse 3 now, to transport the fiery coals from the outside altar of the tabernacle, the altar of sacrifice, which was called the brazen altar. And he would, this, the high priest and the priest would come and take the hot coals and bring them into the altar of incense inside of the tabernacle and deposit those coals into that altar. And we see that in the Old Testament, the incense, they would ignite the incense and the now smoke would rise up and it would represent the incense, the prayers of the people. So today when we sing, let incense rise, day and night, let incense rise, what are we praying? Lord, let our prayers rise to you day and night. In the Bible, incense is symbolic of prayer. So what happens here is that you see one angel coming into the very throne of God, depositing these coals, and you see the prayers of the saints rise up. Now, let's keep reading here in verse 4 because it speaks of that now. And the smoke of the incense, you know, as it's lit by fire, with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. This was an offering. And the prayers are rising up before the throne. 
Whose prayers are they? The prayers of the saints. The prayers of those saints that are suffering now, even in the midst of the tribulation, of those that have been converted, of those that have received Christ Jesus during that time. Many will come to know Jesus during that time. There's going to be a massive revival now. And it says here, as it speaks to us, that the smoke of the incense, the smoke of the incense was the prayer that was rising, that was ascending before God from the angel's hand. What was the incense? It was the beautiful aroma of God's holy people now before the presence of God. And notice this, isn't it incredible that God has a special place before his presence for your prayers? Oftentimes we don't think about that. But as our prayers, are we, as we're lifting our prayers before the Lord and they're rising as incense, God treasures our prayers and it's incense because our prayers are as sweet smelling aroma before him. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Your prayers are like sweet smelling aroma before the presence of God. Write this down, Psalms 141 verse 2. It says this, David would say, let my prayer be set before you as incense. Oh, Lord, let my prayer as I come before you, let it be as incense, the lifting of my, of my hands as the evening sacrifice. I want my prayer, Lord, to be as incense, like a sweet-smelling aroma to you, Lord. And, hey, Lord, the lifting of, of my hands like an evening sacrifice. What is the purpose of prayer here? What is the purpose of prayer now? What is the purpose of prayer tonight? It's not to get man's will done in heaven. Prayer is not to get man's will to be done in heaven, but it is to get God's will to be done on earth. Prayer is to get God's will to be done on earth, even if if it involves judgment. That's what we ought to pray according to his will. And true prayer is, is serious business, so we better not move the altar too far from the throne. Have you ever moved the altar too far from the throne where your prayer is not there in the presence of God? Keep the altar right next to the throne. Keep the altar of prayer right beside the throne so that your prayers are like incense rising before the presence of God. Now notice what happens here as we're receiving this picture of heaven. Verse 5, it says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar. There, as... The altar is lit in fi- on fire and threw it on the earth now. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. They're getting ready to sound the first trumpet. What, what happens here in verse 5? We see that an angel came and, and, and grabbed that censer, filled it with fire, and threw it upon the earth. And there was a response now. This means that judgment is about to begin. There's noises after he throws this upon the earth, this fire that represents judgment. And it's greater or equal to the intensity described in the sixth seal of these earthquakes. Back in chapter 6. But it says now, notice, there's noises, there's thunderings, there's lightnings, and there's an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. What's going to happen here? Greater intensity and judgment. More than the seals, but not as destructive as the bulls that are coming, as those judgments. You see now the first four trumpets that we're going to talk about in chapter 8 here describe now a judgment that is going to affect the land, that is going to affect the land. But then the last three trumpets are those that release a denomi- uh, uh, now a demonic force that is never to be seen before that will torment first and then kill. Just think about the demonic activity that we are not able to see right now. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that there is demonic activity that we cannot physically see right now, but it's spiritually, it's taking place. Now, during this time, you'll be able to see the demonic activity taking place. And it says that the last seven trumpets are uh, now accompanied by a woe. (laughs) There's three woes. Why? Because the last 
three trumpets come with an intensifying judgment of demonic activity now. And it says that the abyss is going to be open and the demons are going to be released and liberated upon this earth to torment and to kill. Now let's read here now when it talks about the desolation, verse 7. The first angel sounded. This is the first trumpet now. And notice how it affects the vegetation that it strikes. And and these are trumpets that we can almost relate to or we reference back to when the nation of Israel was in bondage to Egypt. What happened? That in order for the Lord to come or the Lord to deliver them, what took place? Plagues. These are forms of plagues or judgment in the form of plagues. Notice verse 7, the first angel sounded and hail and fire followed mingled with blood, notice those three combinations, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. You see a plague here of hail that is followed by fire mixed with blood that is thrown down after the first trumpet sounds as a plague now. And what happens? How does it affect here the earth? It it devastates the earth. Because not all of it, just one-third. Now, take note of this and circle this in your Bible, how specific it is. One-third of the earth's forests were burned. One-third of the earth's trees were burned up. All the green grass was burned up. You think about what's taking place here now, that God is bringing judgment, but before he brings it to his creation... (laughs) And then not only does it affect the, 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 only the balance of nature here, as you see, one-third of everything is dried up and it's burned, but it also affects, as a byproduct, the food supply. The food supply. This is exactly why people are going to be now running for their lives in hunger and running for their lives in terror. In terror. So you think about it, there's no more vegetation. What does it affect as well? It affects the grain. There's no more fields. It affects the fruits. There's nothing to eat. It affects the vegetables. Worldwide, there's a scarcity has never been experienced before. There's a famine that is taking place globally. Now we're talking about the last three and a half years here. Now the second trumpet sounds, verse 8 here says, And the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures of the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed now what what do you think about when you consider this description the second trumpet sounded the seas were struck and a mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea i mean a lot of commentators believe And as you read, you can only imagine that this sounds like a volcano (laughs) that is erupting almost from the sea. Now, notice what it says, burning with fire, erupting. What does a trumpet sound? It it, it describes almost as a volcanic eruption. And it says that the sea becomes like blood. The sea becomes like blood now. And one-third, notice verse 9 here, and verse 8, it says here, and a third of the sea became like blood, only a third, and verse 9, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So what is the byproduct of this? What is the result of this? That one-third of the living creatures of the sea life, of the fish, of production, of the food supply worldwide was died. There is no longer that amount of resources to go around. One-third of the sea living creatures dead. Not only that, one-third of the ships were destroyed. (laughs) We look at the ships right now, and some people say, well, what what good are they for anyway? I still haven't received my Amazon package. (laughs) But one-third of the ships were destroyed. What is this? How does this affect or impact the world. Just think about this. There, one third of sea life is dead. No longer can you receive fruit from vegetation or also from sea life. One third of the ships on the sea are destroyed. Speaks of the shipping industry, of the merchandise, of the industry of uh, enterprise. Now, what can you do? You can't ship, you can't trade. 
There's a high demand for product. There's a high demand for food, for merchandise. If you thought it was hard finding toilet paper during the coronavirus, this is worse. Because now resources are very scarce. But thank God we're not going to have that problem because we're going to be raptured in heaven to be with Jesus. Amen. It says here, verse 10, the third trumpet. What happens here? Then the third angel sounded, and the great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is warm wood. A third of the waters became like warm wood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. So not only does it affect now the sea life and salt water, it also affects now this third trumpet and the judgments and the plagues to come. It affects the fresh spring water. What is it that we need essentially to live? We need what? Drinking water. And what happens here is as the third trumpet is sounded, now the angel sounds it, a great star falls from heaven. And not only a great star falls from heaven, but it came burning like a torch. And it fell on the rivers and on the springs of water. Many people believe that this now star that is burning like a torch, it's something as a comet, a celestial now body, an asteroid, meteorite, that is coming now as a judgment from heaven. Now it falls on the rivers and a third of the rivers of the springs of water now are polluted. There's a massive global pollution where there's no drinking water. And notice what happens, verse 11, the name of the star. Now it gives us a name of this celestial body, potentially being a meteorite or an asteroid called Wormwood. You know what the definition of Wormwood is? Bitterness. <laughs> Bitterness. So many people are going to be drinking or forced to drink from this water that is bitter, and they're going to become sick. Now notice, there's no supernatural way of purification now. It's undrinkable. This is a, a, a crisis now. It's made bitter, and many people die from the bitterness of this water, from the pollution of it. So what takes place here? That, that people are desperate now, and they start to drink of this, and as the water in the in Old Testament, what happens here? The, those waters, when the people rebelled, what is it, was it called? Bitterness as well. Bitterness. It was the judgment of God. It says here, verse 12, the fourth trumpet. Let's look at what happens here because not only is the vegetation that is being struck or the seas that are being struck, the, the fresh drinking waters that are being struck, but also heaven is being struck. Now, the atmosphere, the, the skies that we see of right now, they are also struck. It says here, verse 12, then the fourth angel sounded. This is the fourth trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. They were all struck so that a third of them were darkened. So as you see the sun right now, a third of it was darkened, a third of the moon was darkened, a third of the stars were darkened. You think about how dark that can become for our solar system and for our world, for the earth. But what are the repercussions? It says here now, and it says, and a third of them were dark, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Did you know that God created the sun so perfectly and set the sun so perfectly in the universe that we would not burn to death, but also we would not be so cold enough that we would have enough sunlight from the distance of the sun to the earth to have the enough sunlight and heat radiation to produce life, to produce life. So what happens here as the third of the sun now is darkened? There's radical drops in temperatures. Just think about what happens if a third of the sun was not shining, it was darkened. There's radical now temperature drops that, that makes now and produces severe changes that are meteorological, that are botanical in its the Earth's now atmosphere and biological cycles now that no longer it can produce, the Earth no longer can produce the life it was producing. This is a third less energy available to support life, 
The systems of life, now nature, health, or the food grows. Just think about what happens here. What happens? It's not going to be a time of sunshine and a time of fun and a time of game. As some people would believe, well, I don't care. I can reject the Lord, and I'll just have a good time. I'll party. (laughs) It's not going to be a time of partying. It's going to be a time of judgment, a time of not only spiritual darkness, but a very time of very physical darkness. You're going to feel the darkness during this time. It's going to be palpable. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Notice what it talks about when it speaks of the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13, 9, it says, Behold, The day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the the land desolate. What is he going to do? Lay the land desolate. He will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. What an amazing prophecy here. The sun will be darkened in its going forth and the moon will not cause its light to shine. What's happening here from the stars and its constellations now? What is the Lord doing? He will destroy the sinners from it. What happens here in verse 13? Let's look at what's taking place. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, after this happens, after the fourth Angel sounds the trumpet. There is an angel now with a loud voice. And notice what he, what he says here, this angel. Woe, woe, woe. These are the three woes. And each woe is associated with the last three trumpets that are going to sound. Why does he say woe? He, here this angel now is, is almost now crying out in anguish. This is a cry of anguish now to those that are living on the earth. Oh, whoa. The worst is yet to come. The worst is yet to come. This is exactly what he's describing. This is a voice of agonizing judgment now. And he says, whoa, 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 the, 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 to those that, that are on earth or belong to the world, to the inhabitants of the earth, or to those that belong to the world. Now underline that in your Bible because the woe comes here to those that are not born again. He's saying there's an anguish, an agonizing judgment of what will happen during these last three trumpets of agonizing disruption. Now what does it tell us that the first four trumpets, notice if you read this and you know the grace of God today, and you see that he is now coming and striking one third only, Just think about what the Lord is doing. The first four trumpets also reveal to us not only judgment, but at the same time, every time God judges, he also shows his grace and mercy because it says here that it reveals the mercy of God. This is a partial judgment if you consider it. It's only a third that he's striking, only a third. That means that these trumpets are designed not, not only to judge, but to warn a rebellious world to repent before the final curtain now, now, that's going to happen, and that God, before he smites, he spares. Now, I want you to know that and remember that as we study the judgment of God in these seven trumpets and then go into the three woes, that before God now smites, he first spares. And what is he doing with these woes? These are for God. These four, first four trumpets before the woes are for the people of God to cry out for mercy, not to harden their hearts. These are for the people that are on this earth that have heard the message, that rejected it. Notice what happens. These are for them to not harden their hearts, but to do what? Cry out for mercy to the Lord now, for salvation, to give your life to Jesus, to repent, to confess Him as Lord and Savior, to know, I know and I see this. This is judgment. I need to turn to God. What happened to Pharaoh, the best example of Pharaoh in Egypt? When those plagues came down to Egypt, what happened is that he would not repent. What had happened to his heart? It says, the Bible says, that his heart was hardening. I want to say, when we read these, these chapters of these trumpets and these judgments, when we see the judgment of God even today in this world, 
When you experience the discipline and the judgment of God, you know what the worst thing we can do is to harden our hearts. It's to harden our heart. Why? Because God brings judgment only also to remind us of mercy. To remind us of mercy so that we would repent. That we would not harden our heart. How many times do we miss out on the lesson? And and, and in fact, many times you see through Scripture, the nation of Israel missed out on the lesson. There was the judgment. What happened? They cried out to God. And then after, they turn their back on the Lord again. Or there's judgment, and instead of turning to the Lord, we harden our heart, and we don't accept the mercy that he also wants to offer us. You see, here, as he's going to introduce the three woes that are coming, each one was worse than the one before. And if this was hell breaking loose, this really describes, in chapter 9, hell on earth. It truly is hell on earth. It's the Holy Spirit having been removed. It's now the demonic oppression that is real, that is vivid, that not only you can feel the pain, the terror, the horror, but you can see it. That's what makes it worse. You can see it. And you see even right now the groundwork that is being laid with all the the demonic activity. With the books, that people read with the movies that people watch, the horror movies. That's why, I, really, for us as believers, that should not be something that we entertain. Because that is not light, that is darkness. That is not of the Lord. And if we would take these serious, we would understand what the Lord's plan is. As he Now, we saw the preparation, we saw the desolation. Look at the liberation, how the Lord frees now this demonic oppression upon this world. Let's read here, chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit now. It was a star that was fallen now. And notice it says the word fallen, this this star, this angelic being. Some believe that this could be Satan himself, Lucifer, as a star that had fallen previously. We know in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, what did he say, Jesus? He said, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He's described now as an angel that was in heaven through the book of Isaiah. But it says here that this star, as a representative of now the bottomless pit, it says to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Pit, or what's another word for the bottomless pit? The abyss. Would you write that down? To him was given the key to the abyss. And this bottomless pit is, that, that he was given the key to, first it demonstrates to us that, that God is in complete control of this, of all of these events. That when he decides, he then liberates the next judgment to take place, and he is in con- complete control. Notice, this star had to receive the key. He did not have the key. He had to receive the key of the bottomless pit. And notice, the bottomless pit, what is it? Well, it's a prison for the devil and his demons that God has held so that the demons are incarcerated, the demons are isolated, and it's a place where Satan himself will be chained throughout the millennial age. So what does the Bible say? That for a thousand years as we reign, that the Satan is now chained to the abyss or the bottomless pit and he is incarcerated there. Who is in the abyss right now? Some of the demons there. They are chained up in the abyss. The Bible says that when the devil was cast down like lightning upon the earth, he also took down a third of the angels that came down with him. And they have been now isolated, incarcerated now, these, in that bottomless pit. They're reserved for this time of judgment. This is when God is going to liberate and release them upon this world. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Write this down that it would help you understand this. And if God did not spare the angels who sinned, who are the angels who sinned? Those that followed Lucifer. But cast them down to hell and deliver them to chains of darkness. Notice, he's speaking of the bottomless pit or the abyss to be reserved for judgment. God has been reserving them, incarcerating them to release them only to judge. In Jude, chapter 1, verse 6, it also gives reference to this. It says, and the angels who did not keep 
their proper domain. Who are those? Those that were casted down from heaven because they became proud and saying, well, we can be like God too. Wasn't that what Lucifer led, that entourage of angels to be cast down and they did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. What was their abode? Heaven. He has reserved, notice, an everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. God has reserved these now demonic forces for the day of judgment. Notice what happens here in verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, now this star, and the smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. There's a demonic activity. Just see the smoke coming out of this bottomless pit. And what happens here after the smoke? It says that the air and the atmosphere was darkened because of the furnace. And then out of the smoke, locusts, look at who these locusts that are released, came out of the earth to them, was given power as the scorpions of the earth to have power. What does a scorpion do? It stings. And what happens to its sting? there's, there's There's a pain that it produces throughout your body. But it said that out of this bottomless pit, these abyss, these demonic forces come as a form of a locust. And what is it they do? Not only are they a locust, but they're giving the power to sting like a scorpion. Deadly. And now notice, these are demonic forces that bring swarming desolation now. An outward form. What does a locust do? It comes and it brings desolation. It eats up. It comes to bring harm. But notice verse 4, And they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, only those men. They were not designed to come and and, and bring horror or terror upon the earth, upon the land, upon the trees. But it says you can only harm those that do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Do you remember the 144,000 of chapter 7 that had a seal on their foreheads where they could not be touched by these locusts who also had the power to sting now? You see, they had a hunger now for the unregenerate. These these locusts had a hunger for the godless, for Christ-rejecting men. They're coming now, they're commanded not to harm those that were sealed, but only to come and to harm those that never gave their life to Christ. To come and to torment them. Do you know what that word means, torment? It it really is, is the act of fear at maximum degree, torment. The act of fear at, at maximum degree. But notice what happens because God is, is dealing with all this and they were not given authority to kill them. Just think about a torment. It says we're, they're not going to kill at this moment. They're just going to torment. They're going to bring a fear now, a horror, it says here. But to torment them for five months, their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. Let's think about it, like a torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man for five months, it would inflict a physical pain, maybe even a spiritual one. It's going to be so bad in verse 6 that in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. There are people who are going to want to escape from this pain by taking their own lives. Notice what it says, because there is no hope. Because there's no hope during this time. They're going to be desperate now because of the unleashing of this powerful chain demons that have been released from this pit. And in order with attempts, of desperate attempts of ending their misery, they're going to want to commit suicide, but they're going to be unsuccessful. Just think about a time that is so dark where people want to take their own lives, but they are unable to do it. They're unable to do it. Why? Because God has designed them. No, you're not going to die. You're going to experience this fear and this terror that's coming from a pain, an emotional fear that's coming. You're going to be so desperate for hope. And this is a time, this is a, a, a time where God's wrath not only is being poured out, but he's showing his strong and mighty hand. This is a picture where all demonic activity, just think about this. Today, we live under the grace of God. 
To live, today we live under the covering of the Holy Spirit as the church is here. He, the, the Lord is protecting the, the world. But when the, 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 the church is raptured, the activity is released, the demonic activity is released, and the doors are open to the world's most vicious, violent criminals called demons. And they're giving free reign upon this earth now. A full takeover. More powerful than any type of virus or fear that anyone else can inflict. Now notice, it says five months. Why? Because their purpose, their period now, is precisely governed by God. Five months. Why does God do it for five months? Just think about this. Why does God not let them just just go on and torment forever? No, it says for five months, because this five-month period is designed to bring people to what? Repentance. (laughs) That's incredible that you think of God's grace. How can you possibly do this, Lord? His grace is still there. And notice what happens, verse 7. And the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. What does it mean? They're ready to conquer. On their heads were crowns of something like gold. Notice here, not only they came for battle, war and horses, they wore a crown. They wanted to conquer now. And their faces were like the faces of man. They were fierce. They were powerful. They were deadly. And their hair was like a woman's hair. And their teeth were like lion's teeth. Just think about that. Someone would say, well, I think I know someone that looks like that. (laughs) No, you don't. I'm glad you're still listening. But their hair was like a woman's hair, and their teeth was like a lion's teeth. Now, notice what happens here. It, It almost brings a deceptive seduction. Isn't that what the devil is in his in his demonic activity? Woman's hair. But notice what happens. The teeth are like lions. A deceptive seduction. It's going to bring every type of layer of judgment. And and, and notice what happens here in verse 9. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. They had an armor. They were indestructible. They were invincible, invulnerable, incapable of being killed. They were supernatural. Of their wings was like the sound of many chariots, the sound of their wings with many horses running into battle. Just think about how powerful it was. They had a tails like scorpions, and there were, there were stings in their tails now, and the power was to hurt men for five months. Now notice they had tails, and in their tails were scorpions like the stings, and they had a king over them. Now notice, these locusts had a king over them. And notice what it, how it describes here, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek, he has the name Apollon. You know what the name of, that, the, the name of this destroyer is? N- not, notice what it's called, Apollon or Abaddon. The definition of the name is destroyer. <laughs> a destroyer. A satanic angel. Satanic angel now. Some believe that this potentially is Satan himself, that is their king over them. Notice verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, still more woes are coming after these things. We're not done yet. Have you thought that was bad? We are not done yet. That's what he's saying. One woe is past before two more are coming after this. You see, we can go on for the rest of, The evening, speaking of the rest of the woes, but notice, I want to give you two final points before we close tonight. And we're going to end there tonight. Is that what are we to do in in, in the face of all this demonic now activity that is real? What are we to do today? Knowing the judgment of God that is to come. Number one, we are, we should be very careful that we don't forget the lessons in the judgment. In the judgment and the discipline that God has. But number one, I want to give you this. Would you write this down? We are to submit ourselves to God today. What are you to do in light of all this judgment? In light of all this, number one, submit yourself to God today. Repent if you need to get right with God. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, well, I'm kind of casual with the Lord. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll get right with him later. Don't wait till later. 
You don't want to go through this. Number one, what should you do? We are to submit ourselves to God today. Write this down, Romans 13, verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Cast off those works of darkness. Live for God already. Make a decision to follow Jesus. Let us walk properly as it is in the day, not in revilery, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife or in envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Get serious with God today. Get serious with God today because he can come at any moment. He can come tonight as we're on our way home. Number one, we are to submit ourselves to God today. But number two, we are to warn those who we love. Write this down. Warn those who you love. Evangelize. Evangelize. Don't just walk away like this out of here tonight saying, well, I cannot believe the things that are to come. Are you sharing those things with your loved ones? That they would not have to go through this time of wrath, the the brothers and the sisters and the aunts and the people that you know, the father and the mother. Evangelize the people. 1 Peter 4, 7, write this down. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. The end is at hand. Therefore, because it's at hand, be sober and be serious and be watchful in your prayers. You know what the problem is oftentimes is that we are not serious that the end is to come. You know, the real test, we can read Revelation, we can read prophecy, but the real test of how much you believe this prophetic truth that we went over today is going to be reflected on what you do with it now. Are you willing to warn those people that you love? Are you willing to warn the people that you love? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Number one, we are to submit ourselves to God. But number two, we are to warn those that we love. You see, any Christian who will not evangelize will soon fossilize. (laughs) You're just going to dry up. But we need to tell other people about Jesus. We need to make things right with the Lord. And maybe today is the day that you say, today I'm going to make things right with the Lord. Because I don't want to go through this. I want to truly, I want to truly be living for Jesus today. I want to live for Jesus today. Like Paul said, it is not I who live any longer, but I'm crucified with Christ. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live, I don't live in the flesh, but I live for Christ Jesus who died for me.